Hello everybody and welcome back to the Triple Jump podcast. It is a video game podcast despite what the algorithms might tell you. Mm. They're lying to you. They're keeping the truth. Why don't you wake up, sheeple? There's no athletics here. Get out of the uh, the the matrix tank. Yeah, God. And see the truth. Vapor trails. Am I right? Vapor trails. Yeah, the planes. They're called chem, chem trails. Oh yeah, they're actually called. But the real thing is vapor. No, sorry. The real thing is chem trails. Yeah. And the government tell us that they're vapor trails. They tell us. Yeah. Just like they tell you that this is an athletics podcast, but it's not. No. It's a video game podcast. My name is Ben. And my name is Peter. Peter. Mm. We're in December. We are. Can you tell? That means we're in full chrism mode. If you're watching on the video version. Peter's got a jingle jangle, and he's flibbling it around all over the place. You're not watching on the video version. Number one, you can't see what I'm doing. And number two, it probably sounds a bit weird. It probably the way does I'm sound a bit moving weird. Moving my, my mouth around my mic like he's that. Spinning. You're going to make yourself all dizzy. Yeah, I am a bit careful now. Careful, Peter. Mm. Before we go any further, we need to talk about this week's sponsor. Every week, we are provided with a very, very generous, mm. relevant sponsor yeah. that helps us bring the show to you once a week. And Peter's got the ad read in front of him now. <clears throat> Come on down to King's Cat Cafe. Oh, yeah, now you too can drink a cup of tea and or coffee. Well, not and, tea or coffee. Tea or coffee. Uh, a, a pastry or a, a, some sort of baked good, like a millionaire shortbread. Yeah. Uh, and, and sit around, uh, where all around you, large... Luchadors with um, d- different feline masks sort of wrestle each other. Okay, this uh, is King with the leopard. Leopard? Yeah, jaguar. Jaguar. Something. Jaguar mask. Yeah, yeah, that King, and he's got a cafe. Cat cafe. Yeah. Cat cafe. Sorry. Guess it's a bit weird that like he owns the cafe and he's in charge of it, but right. all of the things in it to pet are also people that ought to be on sort of on his level it's like a cat owning a cat cafe right so are you i'm confused are you petting cats or are you petting people who look like king no yeah the tekken fighter yeah you're petting various feline luchadors i mean that's definitely going to have an appeal to some people yeah for it's like sure a furry thing but well it may not even be a furry thing they've just got some hot bods haven't they well that was about i was about to say it's Go not pet even some hot bods it's better than a furry thing because furries have not just a furry head and tail but like a whole suit but this, these guys or girls, or girls, just have like a, a a sexy like leopard head or a tiger head or something. Yeah, and then just a twelve pack, just a twelve pack that you can stroke. In fact, you, I think you can eat your cakes off of their chest. It's that hard and oh, flat. Oh wow! Yeah, are they remotely sort of into their situation though? Because I've been to real cat cafes. Yeah, and the cats are just kind of over it. Yeah, they don't like. Do you need to have treats for the? Lucha, luchadoras and, and luchadoras to to come over and let you pet their bellies or or are they just like they're super up for it you just rub them down with oil and stuff and that's just they just love it uh i think you've been i've been i'm trying to remember see so it was a long was it time that ago. traumatic or? no it was, was just, that good it was years and years and years ago okay um they have like scratching posts mm-hmm. and little mice on string Right. They have actual cat toys. So they do behave like cats. The more you describe this, the more this is definitely some kind of bondage fetish. No, they, cafe. Don't, they don't behave like cats. They're wrestling each other all up in in that in the, in that place. In the, in the place. But yeah, the only th- sort of enrichment provided for them is like climbing frames and scratching posts, which they don't probably don't really use because they're no. like, well, I'm a I'm a human being. They need weights and I just want to wrestle. Protein shakes. That's probably why they wrestle each other so much because there's nothing else to do. Right, probably not. So, so you just is it? Are you just describing a, a wrestling venue, with cat themed participants? No, no, it's it's like a cafe. It is a real cafe. Yeah. Do they? So you can get tea and or coffee there. Yeah, yeah. And Great. Delicious. Um, you know, maybe a maybe a Battenberg. A Battenberg. Maybe a Kattenberg. A, a scone. A a sc- oh, what's it? A, uh, I can't think of a pun for scone. Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, for cat, like Kattenberg. Yeah. No, it was uh, a hard, hard to do things like that with a one syllable. One. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, where's the cat gone? Where's the cat's gone? It's gone. It's gone. There we go. Some tiger bread. <laughs> oh, that's very good, Peter. A lion bar. And it would be wonderful if it weren't such a lie. 
It is a lie you've I'm been lying. lied to. You've been Christmas lied to. Yeah. You flipping idiots. Every single week. Got you. You fall for it. You were already Googling where you can go and go to King's Cup. Bunch Cup. of morons. Use a Brian, dumbass. Unbelievable. This podcast is actually brought to us by the wonderful patrons over at patreon.com forward slash team triple jump. They provide monetary uh, incentive and that affords us the ability to do this every single week. That's but true. not only that, Peter, mm-hmm. if you donate one dollar or more, you, you, you get to ask questions for this show. So all the questions that we do on the podcast are from patrons from one dollar or up. But obviously there are other tiers as well. This is true. Yeah. Well, you can pay more and you get access to other things. You do. But $1, get access to the podcast post where we ask for your questions. First question, Peter, mm-hmm. comes from Ginny. Ginny. Ginny says, are there any indie games that you enjoyed but didn't hear much about? Mm. I feel like there are always a couple of hidden gems tucked away that don't get the praise and attention they deserve. Well, deserve. Deserve. There's a couple of indie games that I played that, like, I feel like they deserve more praise, but I don't think they necessarily fall into what the question was asking, which is that they didn't get, like they they barely got any kind of thing. Like mine, what I'm saying is both of my games are reasonably well known to PC gamers, but I still feel like they should be even more out there. Right. Um, Maybe should have even been ported to consoles. Minecraft. (laughs) No. No. Okay. Sadly not. What have you got? Uh, One that I've only, I only played in its, in its beta mode. I think it's now out fully. Uh, but I played early access Overgrowth, which is the one where you play as like this rabbit man. Mm. He's quite tall and he has like human human uh, proportions, but a rabbit's head. Sounds a bit scary. And he sort of sprints around and jumps around. There's like a really interesting sort of movement set of mechanics. Uh, and then there's this very quite complex uh, brawling thing where... You fight and you you dodge, but it's very fluid and like the 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 way that the limbs hit each other is like very um, uh, dynamic and like reactive. So mm-hmm. it's not just like it's playing a punch animation and and a, oh I've just been hit animation. It's like they're they're almost like independent. They're actual entities right. that are hitting each other and interacting. Okay. Um, and it's just this bizarre anthropomorphic world, uh, somewhat like kind of photorealistic, even though. It's a weird rabbit man in a kind of abstract place made out of cubes and stuff. Oh. Uh, people probably know what I'm talking about. Just purely for, like, the way it plays, I think, like, you know, I wish that that was a bit more mainstream. I think it just took a long time for it to be made. It was in early access for years and years and years to the point that, you know, when a game like that finally comes out, like, properly, it's like, oh, oh that, that, that old thing. Oh, yeah. It's done now. I remember. Anyway, okay. so that, that was that. Um but also, probably the, the game does count as an indie game in that it's made by an independent developer and published by them. Uh, the indie game I played the most uh, would be Orcs Must Die and Orcs yes. Must Die 2. You've spoken about that I think before. I spoke about that last last week, actually, coincidentally. Mm, you may have done. Uh, but super fun tower defense game set in a sort of um, stereotypical fantasy, almost fairy tale-like world where... Um, you you have waves of different enemies coming at your your rift and you have to protect the rift by building traps you can build like actual blocks that make them have to maze around so that you okay. know like the choke points and stuff uh, but when each wave comes in it's not just a case of like watching and seeing if your towers do their work it's uh you're actually a third person character as well running around using weapons on these enemies so it's a it's a mixture of tower defense and just sort of third person hack and slash mm. so uh a lot of fun i really enjoyed that game i put so many hours into it and nearly cost me my degree i think but it didn't but it didn't because you successfully defended your degree using the skills you learned yeah in orcs must die exclamation mark exclamation mark it's made by robot entertainment i think oh called. yes robot entertainment yes um i know them well they made a third one which is it was a bit MOBA-ish. Oh. It sort of took a sidestep. That's uh, a shame. But they've now announced Orcs Must Die 3, which oh. I think is back to the original format. That's exciting. We're going to lose you, aren't we? Possibly. We'll never see him again. Yes. Yes. But yeah. what about your indigo experiences? Well, I have one in particular, and I have spoken about it on this podcast before, and that's Oxen Free. Oh, yeah. I never heard of this um, until... 
I think it was a PlayStation Access video, actually. They were... Hello. Some... Hello, you've caught me you've thinking caught me about oxen free. Saying Ollie Ollie oxen free. It was some it was some video about games for players who don't have a lot of free time to play games or something. It was some kind of list like that. Oh right, yeah. And oxen free was one of them and I thought, you know what? I'll I'll get that. That sounds cool. And I'm I'm always into my narrative heavy, well-written, interesting games, mm-hmm. especially if it's uh, you know, if it's short, that's great. I like those sort of bite-sized experiences. Oxenfree is very much that. It's a bit spooky. It's a bit spooky, though. Yeah. You sort of choose dialogue options on the fly. It's presented in a in, a, in an almost 2D forced perspective uh, camera angle mm-hmm. where you're, you're looking side-on at the environment and you're controlling a character that moves around it. But it's not like a platformer or anything like that. You're just... It's sort of a very basic, very basic adventure game where there's, there's very little puzzle solving. It's more about the dialogue and the story that's going on. Yeah, I've and seen footage of it. on the fly, you get to press the face buttons to pick a response to what the other characters are saying to you. And it's not like Telltale, where you just sort of stand there awkwardly waiting for your timer to run down. If you don't press a button within the time, your character just won't say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, like Man of Medan. A bit like Man of Medan. It says nothing. Except you don't stand there and go... Uh, while you're waiting to speak and yeah. then you, the camera doesn't linger on you for ages it's just all the all the dialogue tends to happen you know while you're walking and stuff so it all feels very natural right. and you can just it changes the dynamic that you have with the other characters and whether or not they're more likely to do certain things for you but it's not a very long game it's like maybe three hours long and you go to this island sort of like a almost like a spring break kind of thing. Right. I, I don't really know what spring break is. It's sort of self-explanatory, I Half imagine. Term. Yeah, kind of thing. But like, th- there's this tradition where these college kids go to this island and there a few of you go, but then there's this weird radio signal that's on that's coming from the island and the island has been abandoned. It was like a former military base. Oh. And you start tuning your radio to it and sort of weird, weird stuff starts happening where like scenes start repeating themselves. Right. among other sort of spooky, unsettling, fun. I like it when, not horror, but I like it when games that try to mess with you actually use the game to mess with you. Right. Where it makes you feel like, oh, hang on, haven't I, have I just done this? And mm. you're like, oh, oh, okay. It's being clever with me. Sort of like Kojima used to do with MGS1. With yeah, yeah. Controllers being unplugged and stuff. I like that kind of thing. And uh, it, it's really good. I really, really enjoyed it. And um, they've got a new game out now called After Party that seems to be not spooky, but is, is a similar style of game where, where it's he- very dialogue heavy. And so if you're into that kind of game that doesn't present any kind of challenge, but it just gives you an experience and it sort of straddles what we would uh, unfairly title a walking simulator right. and also an, a narrative experience that tells a proper story, uh, I'd, I'd highly recommend playing Oxenfree. It's I was going to say, it sounds... Although stylistically completely different, visually, I mean, um, it sounds like it's got some parallels with uh, everybody's gone to the rapture in terms of you're you're walking around. I know there's not dialogue options in that game, but mm. it's that kind of thing where it's not a horror game, yeah. but there's like weird radio signals. It's just and, a bit unsettling. Yeah, you're like, what has happened here in this mm. like kind of pretty place, but also terrifying because no one's here place yeah there, yeah. there are definitely parallels there it's obviously far more involved yeah. yeah because there's there's near constant conversation because yeah. you've got a group of friends with you and they're all talking to each other like oh this is weird what's going on but that kind of weird separated vibe. and stuff and you see your friend doing sort of like a Blair Witch thing and then you go in there and they just sort of levitate and disappear off the screen and you're like, what? Right. what? And it turns out they weren't really there and they're just somewhere else, like they're behind you or something. It's Yeah, it's it's very good. It's definitely worth playing. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's an indie gem. I think it's really good and people yeah. should play it. And I want to play After Party as well because that sounds good too. Oh, yeah. There we go. Well, good. Speaking of things we want to play, or have played, I should clarify. Yes. It's time for What We Played. Okay. Peter. Yes. What you playing? Taking a trip back to um, Battlefront 2 campaign mode this week. Okay. As part of my my Star Wars marathon in the lead up to episode 9. Ah. Because that is, you know, I mean. Canon. Well, there's lots of things that are canon that I was like, well, I'm. It's canon, but I'm not going to play that slash watch that slash read that. Right. But that is canon 
in the sense that it actually involves it's kind of like Skywalker Saga um, you know so for example the Solo movie mm-hmm. you could argue that that's not necessary to watch in a marathon although it does involve Han Solo who is part of that you know nine film saga mm-hmm. it's, it doesn't really like add to the story of like the Empire and the Rebellion and the First Order right. but um, Battlefront Two, I think it does. And the other thing it does well is it bridges the gap between certain movies. So after episode six, when the Death Star explodes, you then play a bunch of stuff in the Battlefront 2 campaign that leads up to the Battle of Jakku, which is where Rey lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so that bridges a gap nicely. And then after you finish the campaign, there is uh, a small mission where you play as Kylo Ren that leads almost right up to the first uh, bit of episode seven where Kylo lands in that village and right. starts smashing the place up. Gotcha. Um, then the DLC they released for that game, free DLC, is set between seven and eight as well. So I think, mm. you know, it's, it's probably, you know, if you've got the time, you should maybe add it to your, to your preparation for the films if that's what you're doing. Um, but somehow... They've like really flipped it up. And I don't know how or why, because there was no need to do any updates or changes or anything to that campaign. Yeah. But they've done something, I'm guessing, in a recent update, which has now caused all of the gonk droids, which are the little like cube ones with the tiny legs, yeah. which are just scenery. Obviously, they're not involved in the combat at all. Mm-hmm. They're all just like, I can't even do it. Let me do it with, with Dick Machinko if you're watching on... Okay. If you're watching on stream, yeah, on the on the video, you're unfurling his legs. So standing like this, they should be standing like this with standing a big, up, big right. block body like that. Yeah, what they're actually standing like oh, is so their legs are all folded. They're like they're they're like they're standing sort of like this. So their legs are like coming up off the ground, and their bodies are going down onto the ground. So they've basically bent forwards on their hips, right. really badly. Like in a in a completely glitchy way, like they they've just been folded in half. Oh, so it's not right. No, and a lot of the enemies I found are getting caught in in these loops of like going into cover, out of cover, into cover, out of cover. Like they've found a point where they want to go into cover against a wall, mm-hmm. and they're sort of hopping in, quickly standing up, stepping back, and then going in, standing up, stepping back. They've they've somehow like glitched this campaign out, and I don't Jesus. know what because like surely there was nothing to mess with. It was working perfectly fine already mm. so how have they done that in a recent update i don't understand that's so weird anyway it's not fortunately it's not hindering my experience too much it's, if anything it's made it easier because i can just <laughs> kill the enemies those but, gonk droids are dangerous well there's not so many fortunately there's not so many gonk droids you know from you know in in most of the levels there's a couple in the in the beginning because you're on a ship um and uh, there's lots on the ship but yeah yeah for the most part I'm I'm not finding it too intrusive, but uh, yeah, that's a weird thing that happened. That is weird. Um, I don't know. I don't, I just don't understand it. You know, mm. they've not they've they've not changed that story mode at all. So how has this glitch suddenly entered Someone's into just the changed code? a number yeah. somewhere and it's just messed it? Yeah, messed definitely. it up. Um, so that's mostly what I've been playing. I did a little bit more of uh, Fallen Order sort of end game stuff where you can just go around collecting things. But apart yeah. from that, yeah. Nice. Just a bit of a Star Warsy week for me. Lovely. I have had n- no time to play anything. Oh no. Uh, because I was away over the weekend for the for the whole weekend from uh, Friday, immediately following work, to Sunday at about eleven p.m. is when I got back. So I didn't I didn't have any time for any games. Mm-hmm. I squeezed in a tiny tiny little bit, sort of like a couple of hours so far this week of just Borderlands Three New Game Plus in the evenings. Right, but that's 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 it. That's all I've been able to play. I've got to say, it's like it's. I, I put on. You get access to mayhem mode after you finish the game, right? And it's got three different levels, and it basically adds various handicaps to your game, but massively increases or incrementally, depending on the level you've got it on, increment incrementally increases the amount of um, XP you get. Okay. Level 50 is the level cap, but then you get you unlock this whole new skill tree, which is quite a nice idea, actually, which you then level up as if it were a proper level. Mm-hmm. So it sort of works like if you're familiar with Destiny and its light levels, you reach the level cap, and then depending on what loot you, what gear you've got equipped, you have a light level as well. Right. Except it's not relating to gear at all. It's just it acts as a new level bar. So you don't have 
It's, it's not like level 50 and then in brackets, level uh, 20 on top of that or anything like that. So you're level 50 and then every level you go up, it doesn't count for a new level, but it does let you put uh, sort of like a perk into one of three different skill trees. And I've gone down the one that's my sort of action skill tree. So you don't unlock perks as such. It's more you unlock like percentage increases. So every single level you go up, you get a choice between two things you want to you want to level up your percentage increase in. So that could be reload speed. It could be uh, luck to find, you know, that changes how much the, the quality of the loot you find, mm. your action skill cooldown and stuff. So as you go through, you go up three or four levels, and if you get the right two things popping up, you could potentially, you know, my action skill cooldown is, out and is now like minus 11%. Nice. So it's just ways to sort of, in, in, it sort of encourages you to keep playing while being able to modify your character but not keep going up levels and assigning skill points to your actual skill tree. Okay. Uh, so that's quite nice. And now that I've put it on Mayhem Plus One, I have just, I got like five legendary weapons drop the other day when I played. Oh, and that's great because they're all level 50 legendary weapons. And now I'm just, I'm just flying, Peter. Yeah. I've got an SMG that when I reload it and throw it, it acts as a little turret and it follows me around and flies around next oh, to me and shoots things. A little turret friend. It's great. It's, um, so yeah, I'm really, I'm really, I'm still really enjoying it. I think it's a great game. And you say that mode makes it more difficult as well. Well, it's surprisingly not affecting the difficulty that much. I suppose what I was going to, what I was trying to say was that the legendaries I've picked up as a result of putting it on yeah. the harder difficulty have made the harder difficulty easier right. than, than the regular was before. Or I got the legendaries from playing it on the harder difficulty. Reminds me of um, in the Halo games. It's not even end game. You can like find these things sort of on your first sort of during your run through. But you, there are these little skulls hidden in every level. There's like one or two in every level. Mm. If you pick one up, um, you can then if you replay a level, you can switch that s skull on. It like adds um, right. a sort of. Um, a, a perk, not a perk, like a condition that you can like include in your in your replay, mm -hmm. and some of them are like just interesting, like fun things. Like there's quite a famous one. It's called um, Grunt or oh, Head Headshot Party or something. I can't remember what it's called. Right. Um, where whenever you do a headshot on a on a grunt, this confetti comes out, and you hear oh. all these children go yay. <laughs> um, and there's one that adds loads of unused dialogue that they recorded that they were like, we can't put that in. Where all the all the characters are saying like stupid stuff and uh, making okay. weird pop culture references. That's and stuff. fun. Um, but some of them are in, and like make it way harder as well. There's some like actual like right. serious difficulty ones where everyone is really grenade happy and they're mm -hmm. just like chucking bombs at you all the time or like you know you you can't reload. You have to like empty your clip. I don't know if that's an actual one, but stuff like that. Right. Um, yeah. So it's, that's always it, fun. Yeah, it's it's kind of similar to that, but without the. I mean, it's a pretty silly game anyway, obviously because mm -hmm. it's Borderlands. But yes, it's basically that. It's just a it's just a modifier for for new game plus that makes things harder and gives you more XP and loot, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, so enjoying that, and then I streamed a bit of Stardew Valley, and that was fun. And uh, it's, pff, this weekend is actually a kind of free week weekend. Yes, which play is all your games. nice. And uh, we're gonna play some Trine Four. Yes, we are. Finally. Yeah. Been looking forward to this for ages Been and we're going to... for our third friend. Yes, yes, our friend. Yeah. Uh, so that that will be really fun. I'm looking forward to that. I but, just uh, realized I also played a bit of uh, B Simulator on my stream. You did? I did. Um, both of which, actually, both both codes for Trine 4 and B Simulator were provided by Jake at Dead Good Media. So absolutely, thank you, Jake. yes. Thank you um, and, uh, you know, that was a nice little chilled out, chilled out session for a couple of hours. Yeah, um, you thinking about being becoming a bee in real life? Yeah, possibly. Seems Maybe like a pretty it. pretty easy life. I possibly, think, possibly. I think you only live for like a year and then you die in the winter. That but, sounds uh, pretty nice sometimes. Unless you're the it? queen, you kind of want that. God, being the queen would be great. You just get to live in yeah. the hive, give be, birth constantly. Yeah, just constant sex. Just I don't, a do bees baby actually factory. have sex, or do they just somehow give birth? I don't. They know. must do. That's how how reproduction works citation needed she just sits in a hive people bring her honey constantly yep. or something i don't know how bees nectar. work possibly yeah, i think the nectar. bee stalk brings new baby new babies yeah babies. babies and uh and then you get to live as well if and you like hibernate and you live in like further years not like all the others who die sounds wonderful peter yeah it sounds really wonderful 
Anyway, we've got another question here. This is from Stuart Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Seasonal greetings, Ben and Peter. It's that time of year again, and I was wondering, what are your favourite Christmas-themed games, or which games do you play to get you in the festive spirit? Before we go any further, Peter, I would like to say thank you very much to everyone uh, who submitted questions. We are getting a lot of game of the year, game of the decade, uh, Christmas-related questions now, I realise, as we approach the end of the year. We will talk at the end of the podcast about how many more podcasts you can expect this year, because obviously mm-hmm. we'll be going home for Christmas and we won't be around. Uh, we'll probably do a dedicated Christmas episode, and we'll make that clear when doing the post, and we'll only answer Christmas questions. Uh, and with Game of the Year, I think we're going to be doing a Game of the Year podcast as well. So hold on to those questions for now. Mm-hmm. We will make it very clear when we need them. Uh, but obviously, it's okay to answer a couple of Christmas questions as we're in December and we're opening our advent calendars. Have you got your advent calendar, Peter? I have. I received an advent calendar in the post. From, from mum? My, from my mother-in-law-to-be. Oh, that's so nice. I didn't expect. So Amy messaged me and said, my mum's sending you something. I don't know what it is. She asked for your address. And I was like, oh, okay fine it's a cease and desist letter. and this thing came through the door and it was a really it was a really thick box so imagine a big flat advent calendar like yeah. that and then it was like that deep that's like five inches i was like what 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 do you mean um so i opened it it's a lego star wars no it is not advent calendar i am is. let me tell you why i'm so jealous yeah i am forever grateful to my mother for always getting me an advent calendar mm. every year even though i'm an old man now yeah but I've always been extremely jealous of the sort of not advent calendars yeah. that, are, that are non-traditional and don't have chalk in. Sometimes you I've get beer had. in them. Sometimes you get toys in them. Mm. Those are so exciting. Yeah. I saw, That's awesome. I saw the Star wars ones. A couple of my Twitter friends had it last year and I was like, oh, wow, that's great. Then I forgot all about it this year. Yeah. And then this year I've been thinking, oh, well, I shouldn't really have an advent calendar <laughs> now that I... I could probably get away with eating a little chock every day, but mm. I was like, I, I shouldn't do. Um, so then that arrived. I was like, it's perfect. Is it Star a mini Wars, figure? Lego? Mini figure in each one? I got. I've had a mini figure, yeah. but you don't always get mini figures. You get like little tiny builds to do. Okay, so it's not like one big build that you slowly do, like the magazine subscriptions, where mm. you get you get two <laughs> bricks in the first issue. I mean, you can put them all together at the end, and, and you can create a scene. It actually, comes with this. So you oh. you you. Prop the advent calendar up against a wall like mm-hmm. that. A little thin flap comes down like that. Wow. And it's a floor and a backdrop. So it's a sky and a floor. I used to love stuff like that. <laughs> I remember advent calendars. They probably do some of them. On the back, you could cut out like yeah. a Santa, please stop here. Or sign. a mask or something. A yeah, reindeer spooky mask. mask. <laughs> yeah. Spooky reindeer mask. That's amazing. It is really good. I'm very jealous. I, I hope you'll take photos when you're all done. I will, yeah. Post them on the social media, which we'll Absolutely. get to at the end of the show. Mm. Anyway. Yes. That was a kind of worms there anyway. asking me that question. Yeah. It's Christmas, and Stuart Baldwin has a Christmassy question. Mm-hmm. We've actually got a, a list going out just before Christmas regarding this exact thing. Ten games that get us in the festive spirit. It's being edited right now. Yeah. And uh, and it should be on the channel. But I'm, I mean, you know, we, we've contributed to that. Obviously, we helped. I say we helped. James wrote it. The, the ever capable script and video editor, James, yeah. who's in the office. Um, but but we, he was, we gave him a few. We gave him some ideas. ideas yeah. and, and I'm happy to discuss one of them without spoiling too much of the list. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Peter, yeah. What's, a, what's a festive game that gets you, gets you in that sexy Christmas spirit? Well, I mean, that's not really how I've... I don't think there's any game mm. that gets me in the Christmas spirit in terms of it depicting Christmas. And you need to play it, otherwise you won't enjoy Christmas. Yeah, there are games with good Christmas levels that I've played. I don't think there are really that many games that are Christmas games Mm. entirely that are good all the way through. Santa Claus saves Christmas. Yeah, I think for the most part, it's games that happen to have a Christmassy slash wintry level or DLC or something. Yeah. And uh, one that I really enjoyed was Bully. Mm. Canis Canum Edit. Canis Canum Edit. Uh, which has a, a level called... A, a, well, it's it's like an entire day. So it Bully plays out like GTA. I'm sure most of you know that, where you, you can go to bed and like a next, the, the next day rolls around and stuff. Mm-hmm. But there's a, a, a whole day called Christmas is Here, and it's a potentially infinite day because normally there's a clock in the top right-hand corner of the screen and you have to make sure you get to lessons on time mm. and get to bed by, like, midnight. Otherwise, you pass out because right. you're only a little boy. Only a little boy. But um, it's it lasts forever, the Christmas day, so that 
because uh, there's all sorts of collectibles you can only get on that day, so they don't want to like give you a time limit to get it all done. Right. Um, and there's just various Christmas emissions. There's like a drunk Santa guy, or like a, a, a yeah, a weird, a weird sort of washed up um, mall Santa, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there's like all these snowmen you have to destroy. You can uh, have snowball fights on that day only. Um, mm. And the whole place is decorated. There's all kinds of apparel to unlock, like jumpers. Gay and, apparel? Gay apparel and uh, hats and things. Um, it's very festive. It's very well done, considering it's just uh, a very brief period within that game. Yeah. Um, I feel like those must always be fun things to design if you're a game yeah. developer. You know, yeah. Like a festive festive mode. And also, normally in that game, if you get detention, you have to mow the lawn. Yeah. Um, but in that uh, on that day, if you get detention, you have to go and shovel snow instead. Ah, that's Quite cool. Good. Yeah. That's very clever. So that's a really good Christmas level, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think I might actually stream this this level slash oh, yeah. thing. Uh, it's the Borderlands 2 DLC. Um, is it, it's either how or when Marcus saved Mercenary Day. Right. And you go to the town of Gingerton. And there's killer snowmen, and I think... Is it a gingerbread village? No. Well, it's sort of very Christmassy themed. It right. might be made out of gingerbread. It's been a while since I played it. Mm-hmm. And uh, th- it's it goes it goes like it goes hard. Like yeah. that game goes hard on that DLC. I wasn't expecting it. There's there's a number of missions in it. They're all very sort of light hearted. Yeah. Uh, but there's like a raid boss at the end, a giant snowman raid boss that you can keep refighting, and he'll get more powerful each time. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end. The train comes through town and just you get to just rob it of all the guns that are on it. And also you just take every single present that's under the Christmas tree in the middle of the town as well. Right. There's like uh what's tiny there's like a tiny Tim uh approximation called sort of smaller than average Timothy or something right. like that. It's it's good fun and, and I really like that. I remember I remember trying one year to sort of you know how people watch Christmas movies mm. in December to get excited for Christmas? I've never really done that. I haven't seen many Christmas movies for that reason. But right. like, I thought, you know what? I'm going to try and do something similar, but actually try, you know, actually play a festive themed thing in yeah. Christmas, uh, Christmas time. And I played through that DLC, which I had played before, many years before. And I played through it with my my younger brother. And it was really like, it, it, there's, something to, there's something to that. There's mm-hmm. something to be said for playing through sort of festive themed things around the the holiday time. I have thought of one that I, I don't know why I didn't think of this in answering this question because I've deliberately uh got in my head that my final stream before we sort of break up for Christmas mm. I'm going to play um uh Little Inferno. Are you aware of that game? No. Uh that might be indie. I think it probably is. It's certainly it's a, an obscure well it's it's a Steam game that okay. you know it's not it's not a blockbuster. But the entire game takes place uh, with this camera just on a this this big sort of empty uh, recess into a wall mm-hmm. that's meant to be like a furnace. Okay. And what you do is you just burn various things with this really quite good fire mechanic. Okay. Um, and you you have to order new things in the catalog. So you've bought your little Inferno trademark fireplace. I think I, I think I know what you're talking about. Right. I've never played it, but that. Why do I know that? Have Yogscast played it? Yogscast played it, yeah. Mu- that must have been it years ago. So you buy your Little Inferno fireplace, mm. and with that comes a catalog from the Little Inferno company, who right. will then send things to you that you order from the catalog to burn. Right. And burning things, you get like extra money out of them somehow. You like make profit from burning okay. these things. And if you burn multiple things together, you get like combo, but you get like a little achievement for like, mm-hmm. say, burning like a, a witch and a cat little toy witch and a little toy cat right or like uh you know some wooden blocks and some blocks with letters on like little cubes Mm -hmm. um and that's really quite it has like a weird festive feel because you're sitting around the fire yeah you're getting loads of presents constantly in the post that you're ordering Mm -hmm. and outside you're getting you're getting weather updates constantly in in the mail from the weatherman who says like it's snowing outside all the time it's in this Mm. somewhat dystopian maybe post-apocalyptic world where right. it's just really snowy outside and everyone just lives in their house <laughs> around their fireplace and burns things huh. um, but like the soundtrack and everything it's like it's quite a it has a weird Christmassy feel about it so I'll be playing that for my for my final live stream okay I'm just gonna google that quickly because I feel like I feel like they've made another game that I've played so it's called Little Inferno Little Inferno yeah 
Inferno. Here we go. Who developed this game? It was... Ooh, 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 the Tomorrow Corporation. Let's have a look what else they've made. Oh, is that the developer's name? Because that's also the name of the company that you buy all your things from, I think. Uh, they made World of Goo. Uh, okay. Seven that's billion humans and human resource, human resources, I'm assuming. Okay, maybe they didn't. I just got very big. It's weird because it, <laughs> I got very big My Name is Mayo vibes from right. it, which is just sort of like a crappy game that you just get for a platinum where you tap a jar of mayonnaise oh, okay. over and over and over again by pressing one button. But that music, I think it's that sort of kind of music mm. that, um, yeah, that sort of like shopping mall. Sort yeah, of. there's that when you, ding, 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 yeah, ding, when you're ding, buying ding. things. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, they got to get big vibes from that. Yeah, well, that's cool. Well, there we go. Those those are some festive games. And look out for that list as well. I think it's going out the week before Christmas. Go mm-hmm. watch it. Go and watch it, please. Peter. Yeah. It's time for something very strange. It is. I've got Santa fluff all over me. That's yeah, these pretty hats, strange. They're sort of shedding the, the fluff, aren't they, onto our yeah. clo- onto our clothings. Are you ready for I some am. weird? Yes. It's time for weird news. It's just in. Weird. That's right. It's that it's that time of time of day. It's that time of day. It's that time of day where we bring you some of the weirdest things going on it's weird. in the in the video game weird. world. It's weird. So weird. Um, so weird. Ben. Yes. Have you got something strange that happened this week? I have, and it actually it's something you should pay close attention to, Peter Austin. I feel like it's relevant. Oh yeah. Are you ready? This is from Polygon. Oh. This is written by Owen's Good. He is. EA Sports kicks legendary player out of FIFA 20. Over Nazi joke. Oh my god. Are you ready, Peter Austin? Yeah. The Netherlands' Marco van Basten is no longer available in FIFA Ultimate Team, the subtitle says. The real question is whether the joke was in favour of the Nazis or against the Nazis. Well, that's debatable. We all want to kick them. We do all want to kick them, but some, there's a time and a place to bring up the Nazis. I know we were talking about a game that had Nazis in. Yeah. We were all sort of skirting around it because the Shouldn't Nazis... Shouldn't have been. Are, are Don't skirt around the Nazis. EA Sports has taken the extraordinary step of informing players with an in-game message that it, that it has removed Dutch football great Marco van Basten from its FIFA Ultimate Team mode in FIFA 20. The ban comes following an appearance on the ne- on the Netherlands' top sport broadcast network in which van Basten off-camera says Sieg Heil oh. as a German football manager leaves an interview. Oh my God. Van Basten says he was mocking the German accent of the pitch reporter in the clip. Fox Sports suspended Van Basten for one week. And then there's a clip there that I'm More not like Van Basted. <laughs> right? Van Basten, 55, is an analyst for, for for Fox Sports in Europe, played forward for the country's famed AFC Ajax club, won the Ballon d'Or three times as Europe's top, f- top football player and helmed the Dutch national team when it made the elimination stage of the 1990 World Cup. So he's got... He's, he's, he's of good pedigree, yeah. football-wise. Mm. That resume earned Van Basten a coveted appearance in FIFA Ultimate Team's pack of player cards rated 89 to 93. Though Van Basten no longer appears in the Ultimate Team auction house, he can be found with a player name search, probably because those who already own the player have listed him for sale, (laughs) and EA Sports doesn't want to penalise them. Today, players logged in to... Oh, sorry. Today, players logging in were greeted with this message from FIFA 20's development team. This is it. I'm going to read it to you now. Mm -hmm. FIFA community, we are aware of the recent comments made by Marco Van Basten. We have an expectation that our commitment to equality and diversity is upheld across our game. As such, we will suspend Marco Van Basten icon items from being available in packs, SBCs and foot draft until further notice. Stay tuned for further updates. The FIFA team. Well, I wish they'd not removed him from the game. Do you know why? Why is that? Because I like to kick Nazis. Well, I mean, and it's he not... could have kicked him in the game. I don't think he's a Nazi necessarily. I think he just made a bad joke. <laughs> he did. He did. He just made... yeah. Van Basten is out of Foot's all-star lineup until further notice. So this may not be a permanent ban. EA Sports has in the past removed players from its game's ultimate team lineup for off-the-field transgressions, most notably with NFL player Ray Rice in 2014. Mm. And that's it. That's the story there. Wow, it's a bit weird, isn't it? That's a bit weird. He he did a he did a he did a very very poorly thought out Nazi joke, and yeah. uh, and then got himself kicked out of actual FIFA twenty. You have to think them out pretty carefully if you're going to do them. You do. Peter thought Peter was up all night thinking about it. it wasn't it wasn't a joke though. No, you were very serious true. about wanting to kick Nazis. Yeah, the car all the way over. 
Peter's straightening his tie. He was like, so I'm just trying to think, how can I... Because I've got to, I've got to say that we'll you'd like to kick today Nazis. If we're on an official Baptist stream, I've got to say it's my opportunity. Got to get to, my message out there. Yeah. My platform about kicking Nazis. When do you think we could bring it? Well, I mean, Wolfenstein's probably Wolfenstein, part of the company. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah, Wolfenstein. We should. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to say it then. Yeah. I'm going to say it. I'm going to wait until the end. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to wait until, until right I'm at the end. Anything else to add? And then I'm going to slide that. Well, you know, well, I like to kick Nazis, kill, so. kill Nazis, and kick Hitler. So, so yeah. Okay then. Okay. Okay then. What have you got a problem with that? Yeah, what have you got? And then Peter squared up to what was her name? Um, I can't remember what she's I saw on Twitter yesterday. She's uh, she's launching a new gamer workout program. She, is she? Yeah, she's fan- she's a fantastic presenter. She, she is was very, very lovely presenter. to us, and I cannot remember her name. No, I can't. So why sorry. can't I? But Peter did square up to her <laughs> after after she challenged his Nazi kicking I philosophy. Did no such thing. Peter, what's your weird news? <sighs> I'm glad that this weird news came around because this is a very old story. And also, I hope that it's definitely weird enough to run as the cover story it for this is. podcast because we can't be having Nazi in the title because it will definitely definitely get us demonetized it's weird enough and has a good visual uh, attachment to it excellent that be good for a thumbnail excellent so this is an old story but there's since been a, a, a new update to it okay. which means I'm allowed to bring it to weird news oh my games Christmas dinner games oh, as no. in the, co- the company the shop Game in the UK, that we game have in the UK. retailer. Games Christmas Tinner now comes with veggie and vegan alternatives. Are you aware of Games Christmas Tinner? This was something they offered years and years ago, like right? Like 2014 or something? I might even say in the article. Tell, tell me about the traditional, tell me about the original Christmas Tinner that Game the Retailer offered us, the gamers. Well, Alistair Jones of Kotaku starts with a whole paragraph saying, Until last night, I lived in innocence, in ignorance. Until last night, I had never heard of Games Christmas Tinner. It goes on and on. <sighs> yeah. Uh, anyway, then Alistair heard about Games Christmas Tinner and says, Apparently, the Christmas Tinner first hit games shelves in 2013, offering lazy gamers an opportunity to enjoy a full three-course festive feast without ever leaving the comfort of their chairs. The original Tinner I mean, kicked... you'd have to heat it up, wouldn't you? Uh, it's not, not strictly true. Well, maybe, it's, maybe it comes pre-cooked. Oh, God. You can eat it cold oh, and congeal. Oh, no. Apparently... Uh, Sorry, uh, the original Tinner kicked off with a layer of scrambled egg and bacon, followed for some reason by mince pies, before working down through a full roast into a layer of Christmas pudding. Um, This is the veggie version, but that's what you're sort of looking at there. It's just just a hellish rainbow of flavours. Layers and layers of different things in a tin shape. Awful. Um, this year, the Tinner has returned, but is accompanied by veggie and vegan options. Clearly, game is not a company prepared to miss out on a market trend. Oh the veggie version has deeply offended me, sandwiching a layer of Toblerone between oh, what? <laughs> between roast parsnip and mashed sprouts. H- how? And Yule log between cauliflower cheese and veggie gravy. How on earth have they done that? That's dis- Well, I don't think they really expect people to buy and eat this. It's just kind of publicity, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I suppose so. But people will. Yeah. We will. By contrast, the vegan option looks pretty good, with a hefty amount of roast dinner making up the majority of the canned contents, topped off with a layer of scrambled tofu and facon, for starters. I've got a problem with the proximity of the vegan custard and chocolate cake to the red cabbage, but I guess it all had to fit in somewhere. <laughs> The Christmas Tinner apparently came to life after a study showed that 43% of players in the UK wanted to spend as much of their Christmas break as possible in front of a screen. I don't look at a screen almost all day on Christmas Day. No. We we might put on the telly for like one program Mm. in the evening. Doctor Who. Well, that's usually Boxing Day. Oh, yeah, day. no, I would nip off for, probably for Doctor Who, actually. Or maybe we'll just watch it the next day. Anyway, right. now it's that's a New Year's thing now. They've changed tact. Because oh, okay. they did so many snow and Christmas-themed aliens that they've run out. Right. Um, we need fe- we need New Year's aliens instead. Yeah. But we will. We my family will probably watch, like, maybe one Christmas special of a show that might look quite good. Like, if they, were, like they did a Wallace and Gromit once, um, A Matter of Loaf and Death. Mm-hmm. And we were like, well, we have to watch that. But... God, 43% of players want to spend as much of their time in front of a screen as possible over Christmas. All three versions of the Christmas tenor will be available to buy on the game website, presumably because Food Standards Agency won't let them be sold over the counter. <laughs> well, oh my God. thank you Kotaku for that one. Mm. 
for bringing the Christmas... Well, thank you, Game, for bringing the Christmas tinner back into relevant media. Let us know in the comments below if you plan on purchasing a Christmas tinner mm. in vegan or vegetarian forms. I'm glad that we don't have any sort of challenges that warrant oh. a punishment coming up. I'd just be sick. That would just, definitely be the punishment. I'd just be sick. Yeah. Uh, Peter, next question from Brian Cahill. Yeah. Hey, guys. With Christmas around the corner, are there any particular games you're hoping to pick up and play, or pick up or play, because you haven't yet had the chance? I, for example, am hoping to finally get around to playing the new God of War. I know, don't judge me too much. Ugh. Keep up the great, the great work. And then it's got an Irish sign-off here that in brackets after that it says, Peter did an excellent job of pronouncing this last time. Okay. I've now forgotten how I pronounced it. Hey, second time's the charm. That's what the phrase is. Slan Algus Benacht. Is that... It is an L, isn't it? Slan... It's not... Did I just say Algus? Slan Argus Benacht. I don't, I don't know. Agus... Who's to say? Great. Well, apparently it means goodbye and best wishes. Thank you. Yes, it does. Brian... Yeah. Uh, thank you, Brian. I've got a pretty quick answer for this one. Yeah. Uh, no, I've not asked for any games for Christmas. No. Uh, I'll be away from home over Christmas, so I won't be able to even play the games that I've been waiting to get around to because yeah. my PS4 will be here. So sorry for a dull answer, but I'm going to have a very game f game light uh, Christmas period. Game light. Game uh, L I G H T. Not right. L I T E. Okay. Um, Dab. Dab. Game like... There we go. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. So, no, probably probably not. Probably not going to have a, a gamey Christmas at all. That's apart fair. from whatever we're eating. Oh, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. You having rabbit? Uh, no. You having venison? No. Well, then is it gamey? No, it's not gamey. Well, then, well maybe, maybe on Boxing Day or something. Oh. How bizarre. Are you going to go hunt it yourself? No. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. I did mind once uh, eat a pheasant that had flown into a window. Right, we lived raw? in the country. No, we, we did cook it. Just straight I, away? I had to like pluck it and skin it and stuff. Oh, and you've never been the same since. It was a bit of a weird thing. Yeah, it like sounds... It, it, it killed itself in a neighbor's window and he brought it around and was like, D do, you, do you guys want this for your, for your tea? We're like, uh, I guess. And my grandma was like, well, if anyone wants it, they're going to have to prepare it themselves. And she, you did you want it that much though, really? Well, I think I was just intrigued by the notion of like preparing a pheasant. So she told okay. me what to do. I think she was pretty well versed in it. Right. Um, and uh, then I was the only one who, who was allowed to eat it at tea time. Oh wow! Everyone else had something grandma else. Grandma had for them. spoken. Yeah. Honestly, Peter, mm -hmm. sounds a little traumatizing. It was okay. Yeah. I was old. I was old enough. I was probably like fourteen. Okay, you've yeah. been working down the mines for at least a decade. Yeah. Though, anyway, point. Christmas. Yeah. Um, <laughs> games that I want to... I've asked for Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. Oh, yeah. I don't usually ask for games, but mm. uh, I would like to play that one, and I'll probably play that when I get back. Like you, I, I'm not going to have my games console there. Take any Switch? I will be... Our Switch. Our Switch. Are you taking the Switch? Are you taking the Switch? Phone? Yes. I will probably take the Switch. Mm. I'm actually staying in a hotel over Christmas. Oh. A hotel not too far from my parents, purely because there are so many... So many grandparents, dozens of them, yeah, apparently, somehow. an invading army of grandparents um, that I, w I the, the sleeping arrangement is I have to share a room with my adult sister. Mm. And I don't want, I, there's no, there are very, very few situations, desperate situations I would be in where I would... I would accept that fate. Really? Not because she's an unpleasant person, just because... I'm a grown ass man and I want a bit of privacy. Yeah, I mean I want my own sleeping quarters. I feel like we're that's talking not... about twin twin beds. Yeah, no, not not sharing a bed. No, because I wouldn't I wouldn't share a bed with my adult no, sister. Absolutely not. I just don't want to share a room either. But I I think I would share a room with her. There are but... certain situations where I would I would be willing to do that, but this was not one of them. And I was like, you know what? I, I'm going to go stay in a travel or right. over Christmas. Do you think your mum will be sad? My mum is sad. Oh. Yeah, she voiced that immediately oh. um so sorry mum but for that reason i'm not taking not taking my ps4 with me that's one of many reasons obviously i wouldn't have a tv to play it on anyway no. even if i did have my own room in the house where i grew up um which i don't because i'm not important enough so and if there was a tv in that room you'd have to tell your sister to get out while you play play games yeah while i play my out because yeah, she, she's because she's a girl and she's not allowed to see them yeah it's illegal stinky girl there will be a tv in the room at the hotel but i don't want to take a ps4 and like leave it in <laughs> plug there. it into a 
TV. Hey, I've done a, that before. Have you? Yeah, yeah, in absolutely. Room. Yeah, yeah, I've done that before. Wow. But I wouldn't do it this time because I wouldn't want to leave it unattended in there. It's a shiny Spider-Man PS4. I don't mm-hmm. want to leave that in there all by itself. Um, so, yes, I will be taking our the Switch. Um, yeah. So, hopefully, I'd like to play some Pokemon Shield. Um, I'm debating whether or not to get the developers of Oxenfree's new game After Party mm-hmm. on Switch or PS4. Uh, okay. I think I might wait and get it on PS4. And so uh, on Switch first. It's it's on both. Oh, but so I just you, mean I'll have, have to wait PS4, to yeah, yeah, I have to wait to play it. Right. So that that period between Christmas and New Year, because I won't be hanging around at my parents too long. Mm-hmm. My family home. Um, so I'll probably Gosh, play that. Fortune in hotels, that's why. Well, it's actually surprisingly cheap. Oh, it's it? weird, Peter. This may surprise you. Not many people want to stay in travel lodges over Christmas. I suppose not. Um, so there we go. It was actually a bit of a bargain. About 80 quid for four nights over actual Christmas day and everything. 80 quid for four nights? Yeah, yeah. Because you would think, wouldn't you, just if you didn't think about it too hard, you'd be like, oh, Christmas, it'd be really expensive getting into a hotel. Yeah, that's what I thought. But actually, no, if you stop and think for more than a minute, it's like, well, no, because no one's going to want to be in the travel lodge. No one wants to stay at a motorway service station travel lodge. Just like non Christian Over Christmas. Guess, and non, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Non. So, yeah, that's it. And then there's the Borderlands 3 DLC, which is coming out on the 19th of December, which I won't be able to play until after Christmas. But that sort of festive period, those are the games I'm hoping to, to get stuck into. Lovely. Yeah, basically. This time. Yeah, is it? You know, like how when we've had our Christmas dindins, we will be really big. Yeah. Really bloated. Yeah. It's time for a big bloated discussion. A big bloated discussion. Peter Austin. Mm-hmm. It is big bloated discussion time, my dude. I feel like we only just celebrated the 20th anniversary of PlayStation. They had that special edition console that yeah. they only gave away in limited amounts and then people were selling them for like thousands and thousands of pounds they had that free theme on that free theme ps4 and ps3 as well oh yeah okay i had it set as my ps3's theme i have a ps3 in my bedroom Mm -hmm. my old ps3 it's the 25th anniversary of playstation this week somehow yeah that's crazy it is uh we have i mean it's no secret that we've both grown up playing playstation Mm -hmm. and may have veered away from it at various points but now are back on playstation um so we've got a question here from Xavier Ram Ram. Yeah. Big big supporter of the channel, Zav Zav Ram Ramarez. How Ramarez. how do you pronounce it, Peter, sorry? Uh X Avia Yeah. Rami. Yeah. Rees. There it is. That's the one. Twenty five years of PlayStation. What are your greatest PlayStation memories? Discuss. Now, to give it this a bit of structure, mm-hmm. we've added in some things we're going to discuss. Categories. Yes. First PlayStation memory, favorite PlayStation exclusive, worst PlayStation memory, and favorite PlayStation memory. Mm-hmm. Let's start, Peter, mm-hmm. with your first PlayStation memory. I have been trying to work out what my first one is. Um, I've mentioned many times in the past on, on various contents yeah. that we've made that uh, my sort of introduction was to gaming was uh, a, an uncle who lived next door who was sort of a lot, a fair bit younger than my parents' generation and a, and a bit older than me. He was kind of an in-between. Okay. Um, so he was like in his maybe early 20s when I was like six, six or seven. Mm-hmm. Um, he had a PS1 um, and I remember watching him and his friends play Command & Conquer Link Up games. Um, they would play them like all night and by like six in the morning, like the game would just be chugging like frame by frame because like, <laughs> they made like bigger and bigger maps and stuff, uh, bases. Um, in terms of me actually playing games with him, I would play The Unholy War, which is a game that I obviously, you mm-hmm. know, spout about a lot, clearly for nostalgic reasons. Um, also, Duke Nukem Time to Kill, played a lot of deathmatch on that. Right. Really quite bloody game, actually, when you blow each other up. There's a lot of dismemberment. I can imagine it's inappropriate for children. Definitely inappropriate. My dad would have been very disappointed. But in terms of the first game that I played on my PlayStation that I probably got in about 1998, 99, something like that, um, my earliest memory is actually playing Demo 1. Oh, yeah. Um, there are actually various Demo 1s. People all think that they, they've the, had the they've same Demo got, 1. They've got the Demo. I've got a Demo 1. Yeah, it's I different to mine. It is. Mine was the one um, that uh, the menu is It's like underwater, and you cycle between things, and it's just um, it's like a seahorse with the name of the game spinning around it, and then you cycle to the next one, and it's like a fish with the name of the game spinning around it. Mm-hmm. It's got some amazing music. But on that were demos for Tomby 1, uh, medieval, 
uh, Crash 3 was on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were some like video demos as well for a couple of games. I think like Buster Move or, nice. or Buster Groove. Gotta love those bubble shooters. Yeah. Um, so that's a no, it's a rhythm dance game. Buster, oh, which one? Buster Move is also a is also a bubble shooter. Maybe I'm thinking of Buster Groove. Yeah, it might be. A Buster yeah. Groove sounds like a dance. It game. does. Buster Move it? is definitely a bubble shooter game. Okay, <laughs> so demo one is probably my earliest like p- memory of playing my own mm. console in my own house. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's very cool. Uh, mine's actually a Christmas memory. Oh yeah, which is when I got my PS One. I think I've spoken about it in passing before on the podcast, but I'll I'll reiterate. Mm-hmm. It arrived in sort of a, an unassuming brown box covered in parcel tape. It was about this big. Mm-hmm. I can't really describe it for people listening. And it was supposedly from Father Christmas. And I seem to remember it arrived after Christmas because there was no post on Christmas and it was potentially ordered a bit late. Right. <laughs> and uh, inside was a PS1. A controller, one of the you know the non dual shock controllers, mm. or maybe a couple oh, yeah. of those those early controllers, and a slew of video games. Nice. One of which was Tomb Raider, mm-hmm. um, which is sort of appropriate. One of which was why? Hmm? Why is it appropriate? As in age appropriate. Oh, I see. Age appropriate. I thought you meant you'll, s- you'll see. Christmas theme. One of which was <laughs> Grand Theft Auto. All oh, right. Um, and I think there was I can't remember what else. There was a couple more in there that were just totally totally inappropriate and i don't know where they where where father christmas and his his elves has had ordered the ps1 from this pre-owned ps1 they've not been counting on what it was coming with yeah maybe they hadn't maybe it was just a selection of games Mm. or whatever but there were certainly a few there that um i remember distinctly my dad seeing them and going oh well it seems father christmas has maybe got a bit confused there (laughs) and uh we went to electronics boutique in Banbury, mm-hmm. in the Castle Key shopping center. Oh. Yeah, very fancy. Mm. And uh, and traded them in. And we got... Um, I bought Final Fantasy... Manhunt. I bought Final <laughs> Fantasy VII. Oh, yeah, okay. With, with, the, with the trade-in value. Which, ironically, really freaked you out. Yeah, also really frightened me. Yeah. For various reasons. Um, so, yeah, that was that's my first PlayStation memory, is actually getting my PlayStation console at Christmas, mm-hmm. my pre-owned one, it arriving with inappropriate games and trading the inappropriate games in in order to buy Final Fantasy VII. Wonderful. Yeah. Hooray! Well, the parade of uh, sort of technical issues in this office and studio continue as the remainder of this podcast, apart from the very end where we sign off, will actually be a static image for those of you watching at home. Our camera just ran out of battery, despite having like three bars of battery. And when it does that, it's always, it's a complete toss of the coin, whether it's going to save the file as yep. normal or just go, nah, nah, nah. Yeah, never mind. So it you just, need that. it just turned off and, uh, and we lost the entire, we've got the audio. Yeah. So we're just going to have a static photo of us doing this. But sadly, there'll be there'll be no more video until the very, very end. Basically, the last sentence. That's how close we were to finishing the podcast yeah. before it just went, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to turn off now. Yeah. Uh, and we wouldn't have lost it. But we have. So enjoy the rest of the static podcast. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's mm-hmm. move on. I don't know if you can hear all the, the rabble going just on outside. Loads, just a, a party of, of people walking around. Uh, to our favorite PlayStation 1 exclusive. I have a mm. feeling yeah. you, you might have the same answer here. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I I couldn't pick one. Oh, okay. So I've picked one for every single PlayStation console I've had. Okay, well, for your PS1 answer, for I think... For my it, PS1 it answer. It may well be the one that you got with your biscuits. With my biscuits? Yeah, I've heard people say that for, like, trade-ins. Oh, yeah, I took oh. some biscuits to the shop. I've never heard that before. No, I think it's, it might be, like, hmm. a regional term. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, no, Final it. Fantasy VII was not a PlayStation exclusive. It was on PC as Good well. Good point. Yeah, ex- that's the thing. Because I, I had a few answers where I was like, oh, would they say that? It's technically like, not oh, an wait, exclusive. No. Like, Resi 4, I think, is one of the... Yeah, there, I mean, I would have said Time game. Splitters for PS2, but it's not an exclusive. So if we're talking strictly exclusive... Sure. I mean, we've we've said many times what our favorite games on various consoles are, but if mm-hmm. we're talking strictly exclusives yeah. for PS1, it's got to be Crash Team Racing. Yeah. As an exclusive game, Crash Team Racing is definitely the, the PS1 game I put the most amount of time into, unless Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 was only on PS1. I think there's probably some Game Boy version yeah, or something. I had it on uh, Game Boy. Oh, dear. that's yeah. That must have been disappointing. It was. It's a side-scroller. <laughs> did, it, uh, did it have sort of a... 
uh, what's it called? Like a like a chip tune version of No FX on it. I think the soundtrack. So, yeah, it probably <laughs> did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awful. Um, but if I go through the other consoles quickly, mm. we've also got. Uh, let's see. PS2. PS2. I have put. It's weird because this one I didn't actually play until way after. It's probably a draw for me. Again, this is exclusive, so my mm. choices were limited. It's probably either Shadow of the Colossus. I thought you might say that, yeah. Um, or Metal Gear Solid 3, which yeah. I didn't play until the HD uh, sort of collection on PS3. Mm -hmm. But it's such a brilliant game. Like, MGS3 is by far my favorite Metal Gear game. Oh, um, I think it's fantastic. So it, between those two for PS2. Mm -hmm. PSP, yeah. I've got here loco roco okay which is delightful mm -hmm. and there has been a remaster released for ps4 as well it's just so I've colorful to get it yeah and it's simple cute. it's on sale at the moment as well i was looking at it last night and i thought should i get it i'm not sure loco roco is fantastic uh ps3 it's a draw between heavy rain and probably uncharted 2 oh good shout am i am i fair oh and the infamous 2 as well Mm. Oh, there's lots of great games, lots of great exclusives on PS3. Oh, I didn't know you, you rated Infamous that much. I well, loved Infamous. I, I knew that Infamous you liked it, great. but not that it was like potential, potential best. It was up there as one of those games that I was, I was really, I, I think about not necessarily the critical reception, but more how excited I was to play that game. Mm -hmm. And I was very excited. I played some crappy Facebook tie-in yeah. game to like unlock in-game rewards for the game, but it was like completely broken and it didn't give you anything. So I had to email support and was like, I've been playing this game. And it was one of those stupid games where you have to wait 20 hours for your energy to uh. come back. I've been playing it for like weeks and I didn't get a single thing from it. Like, oh, sorry, here you go. And they gave me some DLC for like a piece of cosmetic clothing. It was like this entire Ugh. Facebook game was a lie then. What was the point in this? What was the point in developing that? Oh, if it God. doesn't give you anything, I was furious. But I loved the game. That was very good. PlayStation Vita, mm -hmm. Persona 4 Golden, of yeah. course. And PS4 is a very difficult one because we're still in the middle of it. We well, are not in the middle of it, but we're, we're st it's still ongoing. And there have been so many good games on it. There have been so many. I've, I love Bloodborne, obviously. Uh, God of War is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Horizon Zero Dawn. Spider-Man. I've put Spider-Man here yeah. purely because of the amount of fun I had playing it. Mm -hmm. And how much I got into it. I feel like if it didn't, if it was an infamous game, yeah, it would be fine. But the fact that it's got Spider-Man in it as a character mm. and the world and the, and the, and the yeah. enemies and the villains and like that just elevated it to a whole other level I for agree, me yeah. as a big Spidey fan. So Spider-Man, I think is probably my, my favorite, oh God, my favorite PS4 exclusive. Yeah. It does Above take it that else. step further, just having the brand. Like, if it pl if it was an identical game, except instead of Spider-Man, you were playing as, like... Gra Cole McGrath. Grapple Boy. Yes. Who can, like, fling ropes out and yeah. uh, has Swing claws lad. on his hands to crawl up a wall. Yeah. Then uh, it would be, like, a good game, a really good game, but just not quite... Not quite what we wanted. Yeah. It's funny how brands can do that. Peter, tell me about your favorite PlayStation exclusives. I was able to pick one. Um, just one? Yeah, just Ooh, one for okay. the for the whole thing. Just okay. because it, it's just had such an influence on, like, in, in terms of just having that much fun with it and having such a big nostalgia factor, mm -hmm. but also in terms of, like, my kind of tastes, I think, and, like, my kind of um, c creative uh, ideas and things, it, it would be Spyro 1. The Spyro, Spyro 1. Game. I was going to say Bubsy 3D. Oh, yeah, well, nearly. That was a close <laughs> second. Of course, Spyro. I totally forgot about Spyro for right. It it would probably still be Crash Team Racing. Though. Yeah, I know you're a big Crash Team Racing fan, but like yeah. I think if I'd not played that much Spyro One as a kid, I probably would be like less into sci-fi and fantasy as you know as as a as an older as an older human being. Yeah. Um, you know, I think just the soundtrack. And the world design and stuff, especially Spyro One over Two and Three. I think Two is objectively, or maybe even Three, is like mechanically the best game. Mm -hmm. you know, Spyro One is a lot more basic, but uh, there's something about the world design for that that's very whimsical and fantastical and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that like really took me away as a child. Um, it wasn't even one of the first games I played. It might not have even been the first game I completed. Yeah. But I do have a very vivid memory of completing it and just being so pleased and then just kind of wanting to start it all over again. Yeah. Um, in fact, in the final cutscene of that game, once you've got 120% from the final bonus <laughs> level, yeah. Um, 
that uh, Spyro is doing an interview with the news crew and they're like, oh, you know, how, what are you going to do next? What, you know, how, how, what's the future for Spyro? And he's like giving them an answer. And then in the background, he's talking about Nasty Nork and then he says like, oh, he's a good adversary, if nothing else. And then in the background, Nasty Spell comes down and freezes the dragons behind him. Ah. And Spyro turns around and goes, uh-oh, here we go again. And me being a very naive boy who'd not played that many games and didn't have any idea how long games might be i was yeah. like oh my god am i now gonna like be spawned back into the world and like i get a whole new set of levels yeah there'll be a dragon frozen in crystal who like right in front of me and i free him and he says like spyro nasty's back and he's frozen everyone again you're gonna have to go and like f to the, all the other worlds that you've not been to <laughs> i was like so excited so i was Aww. a little bit disappointed that there wasn't even more to play but that just goes to show how much i loved it i guess oh man but um yeah, there are so many games on all the all the different generations that are fantastic. And, oh, I don't know. I'm kind of glad that I didn't even think about including those in my, in my in you know, weighing up the best one. Because if right. I had, I might have actually found it a lot more difficult. Even some of Possibly. those that you just mentioned, I'm like, oh, God. That was good. Actually. <laughs> How many times would you say you've played through Spyro 1 now? Because you do it almost annually, right? Oh, God, I don't know. Um I, I couldn't count like maybe <laughs> yeah more more than as many years as I've had it so and I probably wow. had it when I, I got it when I was maybe seven years old wow. so I've had it for 20 years so I probably played it maybe 30 times or more wow all the way through yeah no like the back of your hand yeah it's not an exclusive anymore of course but no, it was back then it so certainly it was, was a legitimate yeah. answer it still counts for mm. sure what is your worst PlayStation memory other than realizing that there wasn't going to be even more Spyro. <laughs> yes, other than that. Um, I used to get really mad at the final boss of any Tekken game, except maybe right. Tekken 3. I thought that was a fairly forgiving one. But Tekken 1 and 2, trying to fight like Heihachi, mm -hmm. would just, you know, I'd be borderline, as a as a six or seven year old, I'd be borderline like angry crying that I couldn't do Aww. it. And, I never really threw controllers, but I'd just be sitting there going, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> oh, oh, Peter. Um, and going forward, like Tekken 4 onwards as well. Like, oh no, Tekken 4 as well, pretty forgiving. But Tekken 5, God, that's a hard one. Is it? Yeah, really difficult. And then the, the weird, like giant pink Egyptian fella that I mentioned oh, in yeah. a game recently, in a, in a video recently, Azazel, mm -hmm. just impossible. Just so, and it's not even fun. It's like, what is this? You know, <laughs> who designed this? Exactly. Um, so that made me pretty mad. Also, the Wrath of Cortex existing. That that was a pretty bad memory. Yeah, I imagine that was pretty sad. It, everyone thought it was going to be Crash Four, but it was just it was oh, not that. It looked like a fan game at best. Yeah. Um, but probably my my biggest sort of moment of disappointment was um, this really obscure game that I really like called Haven Call of the King. Uh, it's a third-person action RPG for the PS2, exclusive. Um, and uh, the the ending of the game sees the hero get chained to a rock um, and the, the king who he's been looking for, who's going to save the world, has also been chained to a rock next to him and died. And okay. the big bad villain says, ha-ha, all that effort for nothing, you know, you lose, you're chained to a rock. He gets into a ship, he flies away, the credits roll. That's the end. That's it. That's the end. And there was never a sequel? And it was planned to be a trilogy, but it didn't oh, do well enough. Oh, no. But then I discovered, oh, wait, there's a way to unlock something else after the credits if you do this really long, convoluted, difficult thing. You have to go through every level yep. and find the rune stones, which are very well hidden and can only be unlocked by, like, getting loads of keys that are hidden throughout the level. Mm -hmm. When you've got all the rune stones... Then you have to go to like the penultimate level, which sees you flying around in a spaceship in space. And it's pretty cutting edge for its time, actually. You can uh, warp to any of the planets in the solar system in mm. the sky with no... Uh, it's seamless. There's no loading screen. So you fly through space and you go into like hyperspace. And then when you come out, you're at this like new planet. You can then fly down onto the planet, which feels like the size of a planet, <laughs> and scour it... Yeah. It's completely barren. It's just these empty continents with just trees on. And somewhere on that entire globe, there's a big symbol on the floor in the shape of a rune stone. And if you've got all the rune stones, you can then enter that, complete a really difficult challenge where you're in a ball rolling down like a half pipe and you have to go okay. through all these holes. You have to do that like eight times on eight different planets. 
takes ages. It's so difficult. Then I'm like, finally, I've got my rune stones. Go and finish the game again. Do the last level. Mm -hmm. Still get chained to the rock. The credits roll. I was like, okay, maybe it's after the credits. And then what it just shows is like this, the camera is just panning around the model of a city. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, this is the golden city of Aureus. It's the capital of the galaxy. It wasn't featured in this game, but it'll probably feature in like the future games. What do you think uh, could happen? How do you think Haven will survive? So it literally just addresses you as the player. Pretty much, yeah. And it says, send us your thoughts and feedback oh to God. someone at, I think it might have been Traveler's Tales, at travelerstales.com. Oh, like no. an email address. It sounds like that game is more deserving of a Kickstarter than Shenmue. God, yeah. God, it's, it's, you know. And that made you really mad. Well, yeah, because it was so, it, even just my describing it took like five minutes. Like, yeah. imagine how long it took me to actually scour planets for a little symbol on the floor. <laughs> and then when you get to the symbol, you have to do this really difficult half pipe challenge for all of them. Yeah. It just took so long and there was no payoff. No payoff at, at all. all. Oh, God. Anyway, God, that was a rant. That's okay. What was your worst you got it out of your system. PlayStation memory? Uh, I think it for me, it's breaking various consoles. Yeah. So there was oh, there, there was one time, it wasn't even breaking, actually. My cat was walking across my desk where I kept my PS1. I was playing Final Fantasy VII, and it stepped on the eject button, yeah. which opened the disc tray, obviously, and then the game froze, mm -hmm. and I hadn't saved for ages. Oh. That was an annoying one. But uh, it's probably, I was carrying my PS1 through... I don't know why from my bedroom through to the to the living room because I my bedroom was on the ground floor mm -hmm. and uh and and I and I dropped it on the concrete exposed concrete floor because oh. I was my bedroom was like a, a converted garage oh that one that <laughs> no bedroom. not even that one oh this was this this was the first house we lived in right it was a converted actual garage in attached to the house mm -hmm. uh, the the second one I lived in as I've discussed elsewhere before, was just a separate garage that I had to, if I wanted to come inside the house, I had to go outside and yeah. walk barefoot on that. Anyway, that was fun. Um, well, it's because there's a few children, isn't there? And you're, you've got a few si yeah, several I've got siblings. Yeah, I've got several siblings. So, so you need, need, need the space. Need the space yeah. Um, so yeah, I dropped I dropped the, the, th the console on the exposed concrete. Oh. Something was rattling in there, wouldn't work after that. PS2, I've spoken about this before. Simpsons hit and run froze. Pressed the eject button. Did the thing, uh, leant over the console to like oh, yeah. wiggle the wires, and then I leaned on the um, open tray. on the open tray, and it went and it bent down, and then wouldn't go back in. Uh, My PS3 yellow lighted, uh, so that needed to be replaced, and I couldn't really afford to have it replaced. I uh, got a refurbished model, but then that even gave up the ghost after a while, and I then mm -hmm. had to buy another one. PS4 has been great so far. Yeah, but for me, it's probably just broken consoles God, that have, yeah. um, you know, you, d you never, when you rely on something on a day-to-day -day basis, like your laptop or your phone, you don't realize quite how inconvenient and frustrating it is when something goes wrong with it. Yeah. You're like, this throws off everything else in my life because I just, I just assume that this is always going to work. I've never had a broken console experience with any PlayStation console. Have you not? No, they've always just lived for as long as I've needed them and then I've just moved on to the next generation. But... Ah, the PS3 was the big one. Well, that's the thing. Didn't I didn't have that guy. I didn't have a PS3. Instead, I had an Xbox 360 and oh. I did Red Ring of Death at least right. once. I <laughs> might have even had it... I think maybe it happened a second time but it wasn't... I think I had some kind of error that managed to like be fixed. But right. my first Xbox did just... was completely broken. Oh, um, dear. Yeah. Right. Whew, okay. Favorite PlayStation memory? Well, um, I did actually write down completing Spyro 1 to 120%, but yeah. I've, I've already said that. Um, <laughs> mine's a Christmas one, actually. Yeah. Uh, m possibly my favorite PlayStation memory. Not even for it being one of my favorite games, but just the sense, the thrill, the thrill of what I did. The thrill. I had asked in 2000 and something for... Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance on PlayStation 2. Okay. Um, I knew that I liked the game because I'd played it at my uncle's house. Mm. Uh, it's got local co-op, actually, um, and we played that. But I really wanted my own copy. I had a pretty good idea that Father Christmas was going to give it to me. Yeah. I knew who Father Christmas really was. Okay. Uh, but we still talked about him because I had a younger sister. Right. So I knew it would be in the house somewhere. Mm-hmm. All of my family went out one day on a Sunday and I stayed at the house. 
I snuck into my parents' bedroom. I had a look around. I found Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. Back mm -hmm. then, we didn't. Father Christmas didn't wrap our presents. He does now. He didn't wrap them? No. Oh, that's interesting. They were just to be in a big stocking. Huh. Okay. Um, so they didn't need wrapping. But uh, I don't think he did. Anyway, mm. it was there. It wasn't wrapped. And I went and played like <laughs> two and a half hours <sighs> of Dark don't. Alliance. And I was I loved it so much. And then I had to put it back because I was like, oh, they'll be back any minute. So I had to rush and put it back. And then the anticipation for the next like two or three weeks, oh, just no. knowing that I was going to... No, it was really good. It was kind of good, though. It wasn't like that kind of... You're uh, so excited to continue the adventure. Yeah. Your mum wouldn't walk in and go, oh, Peter, you've got some armor that you don't usually unlock until level three. I don't think I even bothered saving it. I think I wanted to restart oh, okay, it anyway. But enough. like, oh... Like I, playing a demo. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I had this really long demo of Dark Alliance, you know, <laughs> in a... In a very naughty way, where I went present hunter. I've never That's done that so before, bad. and never done it since. But God, that was a real thrill, and I was so excited for the game. I <laughs> loved every minute of it when it when I finally got it. Was that PS One? PS Two. PS Two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my my best memory is a PS One memory. Mm -hmm. It was when I sort of properly got into Final Fantasy VII, and it started to make sense to me. And I, it started to really click in a way where I was like, oh, my God. OK. Oh, oh this is awesome. OK, mm -hmm. brilliant. I There's a bit in that game called Cosmo Canyon. I think it's on disc two. Right. It's actually quite scary. It sort of plays on Native American burial groundy type superstitions and spirits and stuff like that. Right. S sort of the music ev evokes that theme. Mm -hmm. And you're there with a, with a tribe of people. The um, Nanaki he's called, which is a red 13, the, the, the dog man from Final Fantasy VII. Right. You know, the little wolf guy? Yes. He's a yes, party member, yeah. he, but he speaks like a person. Right. He, uh, he's from there, and you go visit him and his, his family and stuff, and you're trying to work out why his dad supposedly deserted his mother and the tribe and stuff like that. So there's, there's this proper like story reason for you to be there mm -hmm. and try and work through one of your party member's troubled past and things like that but it's a really spooky area because it's just like the music in that in like the caves like the burial grounds is, is quite scary you're fighting lots of sort of spirity things mm -hmm. and in that game which is one of the many reasons why it's such a it's got such a great combat system you can level up your materia or your magic sort of stuff right so the way it works in Final Fantasy VII is that you get materia, which are sort of like these little balls, and the balls each do different things. So you'll have fire, lightning, ice, even the summon materia will be like little balls. Mm -hmm. And you, you equip them into your weapons, basically, and each weapon has a different amount of slots and stuff like that. And when you use it in battle, your, your materia gets experience and can level up at a certain point. And usually, the, for, for the basic magic elements mm -hmm. it'll go for example fire fire two which is more powerful fire three which is way more powerful and then once you level that up you'll get it to it'll be fire three but master and master and when you get that all the way it it births a new baby fire oh so you'll get an extra fire fire materia to use but it'll be like level zero with no xp right so there's a there's there's a there's a sort of a fun meta game there of making sure that you equip certain things and level them up and they get more powerful as you use them and have them uh in your uh, have them equipped as you win battles and stuff and i remember being in cosmo canyon being a bit scared because i wasn't very good with scary games mm -hmm. and i had to have like the radio on listening to i think it was sean paul was like <laughs> big at the time i was listening to so sean paul was on the radio while i was running around in these caves leveling up he would definitely diffuse a sense of horror oh I he think. would he would uh and uh, i remember fire one leveling up to fire two i mean like what what is what is this? And then I used fire too. And was like, it's different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't more. Do and then I looked into because you know you, when you're young you don't really pay attention to no. all of the meta game stuff. And I was like, oh god, it can level. It's got like a star rating. Is oh look, that's got experience as well. And I remember going into school the next day, primary school, and being so excited and going up to my friend and going, I was playing Final Fantasy VII and like I got fire too and like it's amazing. And he was like, he just had no idea what I was talking about. But <laughs> I remember that specific moment being like a just a proper. Oh, God, games. Yeah. Games are great. God, games. I love games. 
Uh, so I think that might be my favorite PlayStation memory. That or the day the PS3 launched, mm -hmm. which was one I'd been saving up for for a very, very long time. Yeah. And I remember I was doing work experience that week at the Handmade Cake Company. Ooh. Yeah, because nice. there was just a sort of a, a, a family one village over who we knew sort of mm. and the the dad of that family happened to own the handmade cake company yeah mm. very fancy so basically i made i sort of didn't really do anything all week because it was work experience at mm. school made was in was in a factory that made cakes mm. got to take loads of cakes home and just eat cake all week and then on the friday i came home and there was a ps3 there what a week oh it was so good <laughs> and the 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 boss man who drove me in every day was a huge tech guy. So he was just asking me loads of questions about the PS3 and I was just yeah. getting really excited about this PS3 with with all my trays of millionaire shortbread because for quality control reasons, they have to take a slice. They have to take a bite out of a slice of a cake within each batch. Mm -hmm. So there's just stacks of all these cakes in the break room where there's, there's only been one slice taken out of them. Yeah. So nobody there wanted the cakes. I took all the cakes home. God, you probably get sick of it, don't you? When oh, a hundred percent. They must be so them. sick of cakes. Um, but yeah, those. That's definitely. Yeah, I think the first I heard, is my favorite PS memory. I don't know if it's true. We had a round tree factory near us. Oh, okay. and I'm sure someone told me once that when you first get employed there, you're basically allowed to just have as much free round tree as you want. Oh God! Like not even just oh, there's there's a bit of surplus because from testing. It's just like no, you can just take Please, all the round just tree take you like them. because. I think it's almost to sort of make people sick of it as soon right. as possible, and then they just stop. They just stop wanting to take. Home. I think it's more efficient to just say, yeah. "Here's all the round tree ever," and it's like, "Oh God." My friend's brother used to work at a, a chocolate factory, mm. and he used to be able to take home all of the, you know, the rejected products, basically yeah. slightly smashed. And I think he was just just get sick of it, and you yeah. just get fed up of having it. And it's, it's once you once you start getting it for free, and then mm. you have as much of it as you want, it's no longer a treat. Yeah. Well, there we go. Happy 25th birthday to PlayStation. Absolutely. Maybe we'll be here in 25 years, Peter, talking about the 50th birthday. Mm. Probably yeah. not. I'll be dead. Let's oh. talk about... I won't be. How pe You're going to live forever. Yeah. You're, you're already 700 years old. Mm. How people can find us, Peter? They can find us almost everywhere that they want to at Team Triple Jump. Mm. That's youtube.com and twitch.tv forward slash Team Triple Jump for all of our video content. Our social medias are twitter.com and facebook.com forward slash team triple jump. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, have a discord as well, bit.ly forward slash team triple jump. I'd like to thank Lord Brotovich and Cecil Prumps for modding on YouTube and Twitch when we're streaming. Thank you so I'd much. I'd like to thank Luke Eldon for looking after the aforementioned Facebook group. Yes. And I'd like to thank Jack, Joe and Crimson Dragonfly for looking after the discord group <laughs> yes. world yes. zone. Zone. We've got a Patreon, patreon.com forward slash team triple jump. You get Discord rewards and all kinds of other rewards for doing things on there. The podcast, if you're watching the video version and you want an audio version, you can go to play.acast.com forward slash s forward slash triple jump. Careful with that one. Yeah, be careful. And finally, our website, triplej.mup. That's J-U dot M-P. We've got a shop. Yep. We've got a careers tab and nothing on it right now because we're not currently taking anyone on. But our shop has new items on it. It's We've got, got a hat. Brand new shirt and a hat. Mm. So if you're looking for some Christmas gifts for loved ones who like the channel, then that might be the place to go. Yeah. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can do at that Peter Austin and at Ben Potter 20 on Instagram and at that Peter Austin and at confused underscore dude on Twitter. Mm. We do lists every Tuesday and Thursday, streams every Monday, Tuesday and Thursday, Monday and Tuesday being solo streams on Twitch and Thursday being joint streams, plays it on YouTube. Mm. We also do worst games fortnightly, Friday for patrons of a certain tier and Sunday for everybody else. It isn't a worst games week this week, but it will be next week. Yes. So get excited. Podcast is every Saturday and we do various shows basically one every other week speaking of which cut content brand new episode of that with rosie caddick from playstation access Yay. access she was great fun she was uh please go and she watch that lady. it's on the channel now mm -hmm. one other thing actually peter that's going out on sunday mm -hmm. is our wish tat unboxing we bought 200 dollars worth of mystery tat oh. from wish.com most of it coming from china and 
Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, of of dubious quality and legality. Mm. We bought some. You spent half of it. I spent half of it. And it's a video where we unbox and try out all this crap video game merchandise. It's not just bad, like, little bits of merch either. We've got some actual, like, knockoff consoles, too, yeah. that have games on them. So, so you're going to want to watch that. That'll be out tomorrow on Sunday. Please leave us a review on iTunes or your platform of choice. It helps something to do with algorithms. Now, before we go, Peter, mm-hmm. the T-shirt, T-shirt competition winners... They they have now all been contacted, mm-hmm. uh, but we will be announcing them throughout December. Yeah. Uh, we're giving away 25 shirts. So if you see people walking around in a triple jump shirt, say, hey, did you win the competition? And if they say, no, we paid for this shirt, you go, high five, you're an awesome person. You go, ha, no high five for you because I won mine. Because I won mine. Yeah. Streaming and podcast schedule over Christmas is what I've written here. I'm looking at the calendar now, Peter. Mm -hmm. They've got a podcast this week. They'll probably get a podcast next week and a podcast the week after that. So the last podcast of the year will probably be Saturday the 21st of December. The pod last. Yes, the pod last. And then the first podcast of 2020 may not be until a couple of weeks into January just because we're not going to be in the office. Probably the 11th. Probably the 11th, I would imagine. So basically you'll have two weeks. Two weeks podcastless. Yes, yeah, about two weeks with no podcast. And the same will go for streaming as well. There'll be there'll be a little lull there. We'll confirm that probably on the last podcast of the year that we do. Yeah. If you're on Patreon, please keep an eye out because I'm going to be doing a series of posts soon asking for your Game of the Years. Mm-hmm. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate that into our Game of the Year podcast that we're going to do. Uh, in the in the, sort of the the break of 2020, I think we'll also endeavour to continue doing worst games ever, unbroken over the Christmas and New Year period, because mm-hmm. obviously that's something that people pay for uh, on Patreon to see it early. So I think that's worth if we can, you know, no, no guarantees, but I think it's likely that we'll we, do our very best. Yeah. We will do our very best. Uh, finally, Peter, mm. please tell me about this sponsor. We've only got a minute left on the recording. Yes, just enough time left. Uh, it's King's uh, King's Cat Cafe. Oh, you, you come and see some oily cat men with their bods, bod bods. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, they've got cat toys, and they wish that they had actual just human enrichment, not just toys designed for cats. Right. So they're really angry, and they fight each other. Okay. And we, we do mint tea. Oh, mint tea. And coffee. And yeah, it's all sorts of, sort of catnip tea, maybe. Isn't well, there's, there's like breakfast tea and coffee, but there's also sort of herbals. The mints, herbal. Fruit teas. Fruit tea teas. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for listening, everybody. We'll be yeah. back next week. We'll see you all very soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye. Bye.